Dear Flambeau, I received your telegram requesting my assistance with your case. I am able to snatch a day from my business at Glasgow to see you. God be with you, Father Brown. Can I help you with anything, sir? Sir, do you need a porter? Carry your bags for you, sir. Oh, excuse me, Father. I, I didn't notice you. Can I help you? Oh, dear. I, I can't seem to find where I put it. In put what? Oh, that little piece of paper. I hope it's not with my return ticket. I never can seem to find my return ticket. <laughs> what piece of paper, Father? Oh, the one that tells me where I'm going. One of those confounded details. Hey, the devil's in the details, Father. Oh, here it is. Glengyle Castle. That place? Heaven help you, Father. The devil's in that detail is sure enough. What, what do you mean by that? I mean the devil, Father. There it is, Father. Glengyle Castle. Told you I'd be a faithful porter. Told you I'd bring you here. Though it be the very gates of hell. I believe the road to hell is paved more smoothly than the one we just took to get here. Aye, crooked, twisted, inch by inch, mile by mile. All our gold ends up at the Glengyle. He was a mad millionaire, the Earl was. Swore he'd hide from all the world till he found an honest man. And the folk in the village say that as soon as he found one, he swore that he'd give him all the gold he had. All the gold he'd robbed, if you ask me. Hiding from the world till he found an honest man. He, he vowed that literally. Or Scottish. Would take everything literally. And the Earl? Dead. For a while now. I don't know why they sent for you, Father. He would have had none of those popish last rites. And anyhow, it's too late. He's dead. Dead and buried. Good riddance. Let the dead bury their dead, I say. As long as they stay buried. None of us stays buried, my friend. That is one of the most startling truths of our faith. What you tell me of, of the late Earl of Glengarry, do you know it to be true? Not really. Just stories we tell in the village. But the stories say that he was a miser turned hermit. He may have been a thief, or a pirate, or a lunatic for all we know of him. We know nothing of him while he was alive, no less of him now he's dead. But the villagers have their theories. You seemed more certain earlier. You, you seem more doubtful the closer we get to the castle. Aye, such is the curse of this place, Father. The deeper you get into this place, the less you know. My, my good man, you're sounding more and more like an Eastern mystic. Aye, this place will do it to you. And this is as far as I want to go, Father. Take it from me. You'll need your head about you around here. Oh, I've, I've got my head about me. Um, but I can't seem to find is my umbrella. Oh, you handed it to me back at the depot. Oh, thank you. Marvellous, yes indeed. <laughs> I was afraid for a moment there. Yeah, this is for your trouble. No, this is your return ticket. Oh, um, forgive me. Um, let me see now. Uh, where did I... It's all right. Uh, uh, farewell. Father Brown, I'm relieved it is only you. Flambeau, my friend, it's so good to see you again. Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Perhaps it's this empty castle, but your knock at the door reminded me of the dreadful knocking of the porter in Macbeth. No, Flambeau, the porter's gone. A friendly chap. 
but at that other Scottish castle, the one in Macbeth, the knocking was jarring because it came so soon after a murder. Has there, a, has there been a murder here? That is what we are trying to find out. Allow me to introduce Inspector Cravan of Scotland Yard. Pleased to meet you. Well, the pleasure is all mine, Father Brown. I've looked forward to meeting you for a long time. Well, it is certainly refreshing. Most people spend a long time trying to avoid meeting a priest. Not in my case, Father Brown, and certainly not in this case. Your uh, crime-solving abilities are already legendary. But has there, in fact, been a crime? Well, uh, we don't exactly know. We are investigating the death of the Earl of Glengyle. I uh, asked your friend Flambeau for his help. I know that he is a good detective, but uh, I will admit that I was secretly hoping that he would be flummoxed and would ask you for your help. And so here you are, Father. It is a, a mystery that began a long time ago, Father Brown. There are many secrets in these castle walls. The Glengars have owned this castle since the 16th century. Aristocratic family. How did they become aristocrats? Oh, I think you asked that question as if you might already know the answer. Well, I cannot give you the precise details of how they acquired their great wealth, but I can attest to their reputation for violent cunning. There is a, a rhyme repeated in the surrounding countryside. Inch by inch, mile by mile, all of our gold ends up in Glengyle. It sounds familiar. Not a flattering verse. Mm, they're not a well-liked family. For many centuries there had never been a decent lord in Glengyle Castle. One had hoped for something better from the last earl, Archibald Ogilvy. But, uh, well, he at least did something different. In fact, he did something completely unexpected disappeared. No, I do not mean that he went abroad. I mean, he was here, but no one ever saw him. Well, no one, that is, except for a strange and solitary manservant. Appears to be practically deaf and dumb. Evidently, half-witted too. Goes by the name of Israel Gow. Wears a top hat, does he? Yes. Well, do you know no, but you might say we've met. Well, he is the one silent servant on this deserted estate. But uh, the energy with which he would dig potatoes and the regularity with which he would disappear into the kitchen gave the locals the impression that he was providing for the meals of a superior and that the bizarre earl was still concealed in the castle. But uh, if anyone came to see the earl, however, the servant always insisted that he was not at home. Now, one morning, a few months ago, the Presbyterian minister and the provost were summoned here to the castle. They found that this gal, who had been the gardener, the groom and the cook of the place, had added to his many professions that of an undertaker. He had uh, nailed up his noble master in a coffin, and with little or no inquiry, the body of Lord Glengyle, well, if it was the body, was buried in the little graveyard over the hill. It is only now that uh, an official legal investigation is taking place. And what have you discovered so far in your investigation? Uh, come, Father. I will show you what we have not discovered. And uh, this, Father Brown, is the evidence we have collected, if you can call it evidence. Hmm. You seem to have a sort of geological museum here. Not a geological museum. I would say a psychological museum. Oh, for, for Pete's sake, let's not begin with such long words. Don't you know what psychology means? Psychology means being off your chump. It's a new method. Oh, I, I've no need of a new method. Just a cold, hard facts. I mean that we've only found out one thing about Lord Glengyle. He was a maniac. 
Well, I can understand there must have been something odd about the late Earl of Glengyle, or he wouldn't have buried himself alive, nor been in such a hurry to bury himself dead, apparently. But what makes you think it was lunacy? Well, you just listen to the list of things Inspector Cravan has found in this house. <coughs> oh, well, I know what that is at any rate. That's snuff. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Um, I'm a bit allergic. I prefer to smoke my tobacco in a pipe. Bless you. <clears throat> uh, I'll read the list. The inventory of what we found loose and unexplained in the castle. Now, you are to understand that the place generally was dismantled and neglected. All except for one or two rooms which had plainly been inhabited in a simple but not squalid style by somebody. Or somebody who was not the servant gal. The list is as follows. First item, a very considerable hall of precious stones. Nearly all diamonds and all of them loose without uh, any setting whatever. Of course, it is natural that the Glengyle should have family jewels, but those are the sorts of jewels that are almost always set in particular articles of adornment. The Glengyles appear to have kept theirs loose in their pockets, like uh, coppers. Second item, heaps and heaps of loose snuff, as uh, you have correctly surmised, Father Brown. Now, not kept in a hall or even a pouch, but uh, piled in heaps on the mantelpieces, on the sideboard, on the piano, anywhere. It is uh, as if the old gentleman could not take the trouble to look in a pocket or lift a lid. <sighs> Third item. Here and there, about the house, curious little piles of minute pieces of metal. Some like steel springs, and some in the shape of microscopic wheels as if they had gutted a mechanical toy. <clears throat> Fourth item, the, the wax candles, which uh, have to be stuck in bottlenecks because there is nothing else to stick them in. Now, I wish you to note how, how very much queerer this all is than anything we anticipated. We've all seen that there was something wrong about the last Earl. And we have come here to discover whether he really lived here or whether he really died here. Whether that strange scarecrow wandering about who did the burying had anything to do with the dying. But uh, suppose the worst in all this, the most lurid or melodramatic solution you like. Suppose the servant really killed the master. Or suppose the master isn't really dead. Or su suppose the master is dressed up as the servant. Or suppose the servant is buried for the master. Invent what twisted tragedy you like, and you still have not explained a candle without a candlestick. Or why an elderly gentleman of good family should habitually spill snuff on the piano. Now, the, the core of this tale, we can imagine, it is as fringes that are mysterious. But by no stretch of fancy can the human mind connect together snuff and diamonds and, and, and the wax and loose clockwork. I think I see the connection. The Earl of Glengyle was mad against the French Revolution. He was an enthusiast of the old order and was trying to reenact literally the family life of the last Bourbons. He had snuff because it was the 18th century luxury, wax candles because they were the 18th century lighting. The Mechanical bits of iron represent the locksmith hobby of Louis XVI. The diamonds are for the diamond necklace of Marie Antoinette. What a perfectly extraordinary notion. Do you really think that is the truth? I'm perfectly sure it isn't. Only you said nobody could connect snuff with diamonds and clockwork with candles. I gave you that connection offhand. The real story, I'm sure, lies very much deeper. The late Earl of Glengyle was a thief. He lived a second, darker life as a desperate housebreaker. He didn't have any candlesticks because he used those candles cut short in the little lantern he carried. 
The snuff he employed as the fiercest French criminals have used pepper to fling it suddenly in dense masses in the face of a captor, a pursuer. But the final proof lies in the curious coincidence of the diamonds and the small steel wheels. Surely that makes everything plain to you, eh? Diamonds and small steel wheels are the only two objects with which you can cut out a pane of glass. Diamonds and, and small wheels. Uh, is that all that makes you think it is the true explanation? I don't think it is the true explanation. But you said that nobody could connect the four things. The true tale, I'm very sure, is much more humdrum. Glendale had found, or thought he had found, precious stones on his estate. Somebody had bamboozled him with those loose brilliants, saying they were found in the castle caverns. The mechanical bits of iron are some sort of diamond-cutting affair. He would do the thing in a very rough and small way, with the help of a few shepherds or rude fellows on these hills. Snuff is the one great luxury of such Scotch shepherds. It is the one thing with which you can bribe them. They didn't have any candlesticks because they used those candles, well, in their hands as they explored the caves. Is that all? Have we uh, found the dull truth at last? <laughs> no, 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 no. You see, I only said that because you said that nobody could connect the four things. Ten false philosophies will fit the universe. Ten false theories will fit Glengyle Castle. But we want the... Uh, real explanation of the castle and the universe. What about the other exhibits? Items five, six, seven, etc. are certainly more valid than instructive. A curious collection not of lead pencils but of lead out of lead pencils. A senseless stick of bamboo with the top rather splintered. It might be the instrument of a crime, if indeed there has been a crime. The only other thing, an old Catholic prayer book. It appears to be from the Middle Ages with illuminated texts. It could be quite valuable and perhaps some museum would want it. But the pictures have been strangely defaced, cut about. Inspector Craven, you've got a legal warrant, haven't you, to go up and examine that grave? Of course. And the sooner we do it, the better, and get to the bottom of this horrible affair. If I were you, I should start now. Now? Why now? Because this is serious. This isn't spilt snuff or loose pebbles that might be there for a hundred reasons. There is only one reason I know of for this being done, and the reason goes down to the roots of the world. These religious pictures are not just dirtied or torn or scrawled over, which might be done in idleness or bigotry by children or Protestants. These have been treated very carefully and very queerly. In every place where the great ornamented name of God comes in the old illuminations, it has been elaborately taken out. The only other things that have been removed are the halos round the head of the child Jesus and his mother. And therefore I say, let us get our warrant and our spade and our crowbar and go up and break open that coffin. What do you mean? I mean, I mean that the great devil of the universe himself might be sitting at the top tower of this castle at this very moment, as big as a hundred elephants and roaring like the apocalypse. There is black magic somewhere at the bottom of this. Black magic? But what can these other things mean? Something demonic, I suppose. How should I know? How can I guess all their mazes down below? Perhaps 
Perhaps you can make a torture out of snuff and bamboo. Perhaps lunatics lust after wax and steel filings. Perhaps there is a maddening drug made out of lead pencils. The shortcut to the mystery is up the hill and to the grave. things mean. All those material objects point to the one mark of all genuine religions, materialism. And devil worship is a very genuine religion. Keep going. We are only trying to find the truth. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of finding it. I wonder why I really did hide away in the castle like that. Something nasty, I suppose. Was he a leper? <laughs> Something worse than that. What do you imagine would be worse than a leper? I don't imagine it. not being the right shape. My friend, there is one thing that never loses its shape. And that is the sign that protects us. Uh, quite a bit of dirt, quite a bit of decay. The bones of a man. Is he the right shape? Yeah, it seems so. Let's have a closer look. And now I come to think of it, why in the name of madness shouldn't he be all right? Uh, what is it gets hold of a man in these cursed moments? It's like the dream of an atheist. Good heavens. His head is missing. No head. No head. There are three headless men standing around this open grave. Surely there is black magic in this. We have a murder on our hands. The servant cut off the master's head. We must arrest him. Father, what are we to do? Sleep. It is time to sleep. We've come to the end of the ways. Do you know what sleep is? It is a sacrament. Because it is an act of faith and it is a food. And we need a sacrament of only a natural one. Something terrible has fallen on us that falls very seldom on men. What do you mean? We found the truth, and the truth makes no sense.
glow. I know what you did, Gao. And I know why you did it. But there's still one thing I don't quite understand. Perhaps you'll tell me. You know, you know, I, I, I came across a little verse about your Earl, Archibald Ogilvy and his ancestry. Uh, perhaps you, you've heard of it. As green sap to the youthful trees is red gold to the Ogilvy. Perhaps there's something you'd like to confess. I sent word of our investigation to Scotland Yard and received orders this morning to arrest Gow on charges of murder. No, 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 no. The butler didn't do it. You see, he's a very valuable man, that Israel Gow. He does the potatoes amazingly. Well, still, he has his faults. Which of us hasn't? He doesn't dig this bank quite regularly. Oh, Father, what is the meaning of all this? Well, there, for instance, I'm really very doubtful about that potato. And why? I'm doubtful about it because old Gao was doubtful about it himself. He put his trowel in everywhere, but just here, there must be a mighty fine potato. Just here. Skull of the Earl of Glengyle. We must hide it again. If one could only conceive the meaning of this last monstrosity. <laughs> I give it all up. My brain and his world do not fit each other. And there's an end of it. Snuff, candles, sport, prayer books, touch, 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 and the inside touch, touch, of the musical boxes. No, no, what? No, 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 no. All that is as plain as a pike staff. I understand the snuff and the clockwork and all the rest. I understood it the first thing this morning. And since then, I've had it out with old Gal the gardener, who is neither so deaf nor so stupid as he pretends. There, there's nothing amiss among the loose items. I was wrong about the torn prayer book, too. There, there's no harm in that, but it's this last business. Desecrating graves and stealing dead men's skulls. Surely there's harm in that. Surely there's black magic still in that. That doesn't fit into the quite simple story of the snuff and the candles. My friend, you must be careful and remember that I once was a criminal. It was always my style to act quickly, as quickly as I could. This detective business of waiting about is too much for my French impatience. All my life, for good or evil, I have done things at an instant. I have always fought duels the next morning. I have always paid bills on the nail. I never even put off a visit to the dentist. My goodness, what a turnip I am. What a turnip. <laughs> The dentist. <laughs> the dentist. My friends, we have passed a night in torment, but now the sun is risen, the birds are singing, and the radiant form of the dentist consoles the world. <laughs> oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh. I will get some sense out of this, father, if 
I use the tortures of the Inquisition. Don't let me be silly for a moment. You don't know how unhappy I've been. And now I know there is no serious sin in this business at all, but only a little lunacy, perhaps, and who minds that? Father Brown, we would really like to know the whole story, if you please. Very well. This is not the story of a crime. Rather, it is the story of a strange and crooked honesty. We are dealing, perhaps, with the only man on earth who has taken no more than his due. It is a study in savage living logic. That old local rhyme about the house of Glengyle. Inch by inch, mile by mile, all our gold ends up at Glengyle well. That was literal as well as metaphorical. It did not merely mean that, that the Glengyles sought for wealth. It was also true that they literally gathered gold. They had a, a huge collection of ornaments and utensils in gold. They were maniacs for gold and soon became misers for it. Now think for a moment. Go back over the list of all the things we found in the castle. Diamonds without their gold rings. Candles without their gold candlesticks. Snuff without the gold snuff boxes. Pencil leads without the gold pencil cases. A walking stick without its gold top. Clockwork without the gold clocks, or rather watches. And mad as it sounds, because the halos and the name of God in the old missal were of real gold, these also were taken away. Were taken away, but not stolen. Thieves would never have left this mystery. Thieves would have taken the gold snuff boxes, snuff and all. The gold pencil cases, lead and all. We have to deal with a man with a peculiar conscience, but certainly a conscience. I met that mad moralist this morning in this garden and I heard the whole story. It turns out that the locals were nearer the truth with their folk tales than we had suspected, that is usually the case. But they were wrong in ascribing a villainous heart to the late Earl. It turns out the late Earl was the nearest approach to a good man ever born at Glengyle. But his bitter virtue took the turn of the misanthrope. He moped over the dishonesty of his ancestors, from which somehow he generalized a dishonesty of all men. More especially, he distrusted philanthropy. He swore that if he could find one man who would take no more than his exact rights, that man should inherit all the gold of Glengyle. Having delivered this defiance to humanity, he shut himself up without the smallest expectation of its being answered. One day, however, a seemingly deaf and dumb and senseless chap from a distant village brought him a belated telegram. Glengyle, in his acrid pleasantry, gave the chap a, a new farthing. At least he thought he had done so, but when he looked over his change, he found the new farthing still there and a gold sovereign gone. He had given the messenger 20 times more than he had meant to. The accident opened for him vistas of sneering speculation. Either way, the messenger would prove the greasy greed of the species. Either he would vanish, a thief stealing a coin, or he would sneak back virtuously, a snob seeking a reward. Then, in the middle of that night, Glengyle was knocked up out of his bed, for he lived alone, and forced to open the door to the simpleton. The messenger brought with him not the gold sovereign, but exactly 19 shillings and 11 pence, three farthings, change. For a moment the Earl stared at him in disbelief. Then the wild exactitude of this action took hold of the mad lord's brain like fire. He swore he was Diogenes that had long sought out an honest man and at last had found one. He took the literal chap into his huge neglected house and trained him up as his solitary servant but also made him his heir. He made a new will, which I have seen. The will said that upon the death of the Earl, Israel Gow was to inherit all the gold of Glengyle. So far, that is all. And that is simple. And simple as well is Israel Gow. 
the honest man. When his master died, he knew that he'd been promised all the gold of the castle, but only the gold of the castle. Father, what are you saying? I'm saying, God bless him that he took what was rightfully his and only that, but nothing more. Don't you see? He has, he has stripped the house of gold and taken not a grain that was not gold, not so much as a grain of snuff. He took the, the gold snuff boxes, but not the snuff, the gold candlesticks, but not the candles, the gold rings, but not the diamonds in them. He took the gold head off an old walking stick. He even lifted the gold leaf off an old illumination, fully satisfied that he left the rest unspoilt. But, Father, what of the buried skull? Yes, the final detail, the final confounding detail in which the devil hid and made a last stand against our faith and reason. But surely there's no way to exonerate a man, or even a so-called honest man, who detaches and reburies the skull of his master. There was evidence in that garden to arrest him, Father, to condemn him. There was a crime committed in another garden that threatened to condemn us all, Inspector. But there has been no crime here. No, no, no crime! <laughs> I, I could believe you about the snuff and the diamonds and all that rubbish. But a man severs a skull and buries it with the vegetables. And you say there's been no crime? Like you, Inspector. I thought I understood so much, but I could not understand this skull business. I was really uneasy about that human head among the potatoes. It distressed me, <laughs> till Flambeau said the word. The word, dentist. It, it will be all right. Everything will be all right. Israel Gal dug up that grave and remove that skull, but he will put it back in the grave when he has taken the gold out of the tooth. <laughs> the gold that is rightfully his. It was a disturbing mystery. We were on the borderland of despair. We were in a world where nothing made any sense. The only answers to our questions was the ironic grin of a skull. The whole world is like that for many of our fellow travelers, I'm afraid. Meaningless. Filled with details that don't fit and questions answered only by the ridicule of death. Horrible. But at least we have found out the truth, their solution. Indeed. A satisfying solution. <laughs> you call that satisfying? The most satisfying solution to a crime is to find that there is no crime. Thank you.